In the current raging cosmological debate between the heliocentric model and flat Earth, I've noticed almost every anti-flat Earther I come across engages in the same massive intellectual error. They start out falsely assuming the heliocentric model is a scientific position, contrary to popular misconception. It objectively isn't. It's philosophy, not science. And there's not even any need to take my word for it. I will read some quotes from prominent scientists describing why the heliocentric model cannot be scientifically verified over competing options. First, let's start with some quotes explaining why it's not possible to scientifically verify the heliocentric model by appealing to lights in the sky, since all such observations can be interpreted to fit with a range of models. There is no planetary observation by which we can prove that the Earth is moving in an orbit around the Sun. Physicist Bernard Cohen, whether the Earth rotates once a day from west to east or the heavens revolve once a day from east to west, the observable phenomena will be exactly the same. This shows a defect in Newtonian dynamics, since an empirical science ought not to contain a metaphysical assumption which can never be proved or disproved by observation. Physicist Dennis Siama. People need to be aware that there is a range of models that could explain the observations. For instance, I can construct you a universe with Earth at its center, and you cannot disprove it based on observations. You can only exclude it on philosophical grounds. What I want to bring into the open is the fact that we are using philosophical criteria in choosing our models. A lot of cosmology tries to hide that. Physicist George F. Ellis. We can take either the Earth or the Sun, or any other point for that matter, as the center of the solar system. This is certainly so for the purely kinematical problem of describing the planetary motions. It is also possible to take any point as the center even in dynamics, although recognition of this freedom of choice had to await the present century. Astronomer Fred Hoyle. It is possible to describe the entire universe using any chosen point as the unmoving center. The Earth will do very well, and no one can prove that choice is wrong. Scientists today prefer to picture everything in motion and nothing as being the center. If you haven't given much thought to the implications of 20th century science, you may be chagrined to realize that because of the concept of relative motion, no one can prove that the Earth moves. Kitty Ferguson. Let it be understood at the outset that it makes no difference from the point of view of describing planetary motion, whether we take the Earth or the Sun as the center of the solar system. Since the issue is one of relative motion only, there are infinitely many exactly equivalent descriptions referred to different centers. In principle, any point will do. The moon, Jupiter, etc. So the passions loosed on the world by the publication of Copernicus's book De Revolutionibus Orbium Calestium were logically irrelevant. Astronomer Fred Hoyle the Earth-centered system is, in reality, absolutely identical with the system of Copernicus, and all computation of the places of the planets are the same for the two systems. Astronomer John Dreyer. The ancient argument over whether the Earth rotates or the heavens revolve around it, as Aristotle taught, is seen to be no more than an argument over the simplest choice of a frame of reference. Obviously, the most convenient choice is the universe. Nothing, except inconvenience, prevents us from choosing the Earth as a fixed frame of reference. If we choose to make the Earth our fixed frame of reference, we do not even do violence to everyday speech. We say that the sun rises in the morning, sets in the evening, the Big Dipper revolves around the North Star. Which point of view is correct? 
Do the heavens revolve or does the earth rotate? The question is meaningless. Physicist Martin Gardner. The struggle so violent in the early days of science between the views of Ptolemy and Copernicus would then be quite meaningless. Either coordinate system could be used with equal justification. The two sentences, the sun is at rest and the earth moves, or the sun moves and the earth is at rest, would simply mean two different conventions concerning two different coordinate systems. Physicist Albert Einstein. So which is real? The Ptolemaic or Copernican system? Although it is not uncommon for people to say that Copernicus proved Ptolemy wrong, that is not true. One can use either picture as a model of the universe, for our observations of the heavens can be explained by assuming either the Earth or the Sun to be at rest. Physicist Stephen Hawking It is very important to acknowledge that the Copernican theory offers a very exact calculation of the apparent movements of the planets, even though it must be conceded that, from the modern standpoint, practically identical results could be obtained by means of a somewhat revised Ptolemaic system. It makes no sense, accordingly, to speak of a difference in truth between Copernicus and Ptolemy. Both conceptions are equally permissible descriptions. What has been considered as the greatest discovery of Occidental wisdom, as opposed to that of antiquity, is questioned as to its truth value. Physicist Hans Reichenbach. Next, here are some more quotes from prominent scientists. This time, they're covering how Earth's supposed movement has never been scientifically verified either. To the question, whether or not the motion of the Earth in space can be made perceptible in, in terrestrial experiments. We have already remarked that all attempts of this nature led to a negative result. Physicist Albert Einstein. We do not have, and cannot have, any means of discovering whether or not we are carried along in a uniform motion of translation. Physicist Henri Poincaré. The failure of the many attempts to measure terrestrially any effects of the Earth's motion. Physicist Wolfgang Pauli. A great deal of research has been carried out concerning the influence of the Earth's movement. The results were always negative. Physicist Henry Poincaré. Thus, even now, three and a half centuries after Galileo, it is still remarkably difficult to say categorically whether the Earth moves. Physicist Julian B. Barber. We can't feel our motion through space, nor has any physical experiment ever proved that the Earth actually is in motion. Historian Lincoln Barnett. I have come to believe that the motion of the Earth cannot be detected by any optical experiment. Physicist Albert Einstein. And just to avoid the false accusation of, quote, mining from anti-flat earthers, Einstein added his indoctrinated subjective belief when he continued, though the Earth is revolving around the sun, only the first part of this quote is scientific. The second part is simply Einstein's subjective belief, resulting from indoctrination. Not actual scientific verification, like the first part was. Next, here are a few quotes from prominent scientists regarding the famous Michelson-Morley experiment. This conclusion directly contradicts the explanation, which presupposes that the Earth moves. Physicist Albert Michelson. Briefly, everything occurs as if the Earth were at rest. Physicist Henrik Lorentz. The data of the Michelson-Morley experiment were almost unbelievable. There was only one other possible conclusion to draw, that the Earth was at rest. Physicist Bernard Jaffer. 
that was just one alternative. The Earth's true velocity through space might happen to have been nil. Physicist Arthur Eddington. So, in conclusion, if any heliocentrist debater tries to prove Earth is a globe by appealing to observations of lights in the sky or by appealing to Earth's supposed movement, now you'll know the truth, that they've left the domain of science and entered the domain of religion or philosophy the moment they try such tactics. They're no longer debating science. But the real question is, why does mainstream academia present the heliocentric model as if it's science, when even their own scientists know it's not? This quote from Edwin Hubble gives some insight into the rationale behind such dishonesty. Such a condition would imply that we occupy a unique position in the universe, analogous, in a sense, to the ancient conception of a central Earth. This hypothesis cannot be disproved, but it is unwelcome and would only be accepted as a last resort in order to save the phenomena. Therefore, we disregard this possibility. The unwelcome position of a favored location must be avoided at all costs. Such a favored position is intolerable. Astronomer Edwin Hubble. Hmm. That doesn't sound very scientific now, does it? Science is objective. Any pre-existing bias is a systematic error. So, ultimately, what the mainstream scientific community is doing can't rightfully be called science. In truth, they're the scientism community, not the scientific community. But this next quote by scientist Richard Lewontin removes any doubt as to what's motivating their dishonesty. Our willingness to accept scientific claims that are against common sense is the key to an understanding of the real struggle between science and the supernatural. We take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. It is not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, that we are forced by our a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations, no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. Moreover, that materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door.